Hey team, we're in Fremont, California today at Velo3D's latest, newest manufacturing facility. And I'm talking with Zach Murphy, who's the VP of sales at Velo3D. We're going to be sharing a little bit about our partnership with Velo3D and getting some insights from Zach, who's been on the Velo3D journey since essentially the beginning. So he's definitely the man to talk to, and he's the right person to ask. First, what is Velo3D's mission? So Velo3D's mission from the very beginning has been to enable engineers to make the parts that they really need to make. So for whatever system or product uh, they're trying to deliver, for whatever solution they're trying to come up with, Velo3D is essentially a manufacturing technology that allows them to make the part they actually want. And are there certain industries that gravitate towards these, the parts that these machines are capable of making? Uh, yeah, so I think one of the main uh, drivers for using this manufacturing technology is uh, mission critical applications. And so a lot of times the customers that uh, are most interested in our technology are ones where uh, it's like aerospace or space or uh, defense where there are parts that are incredibly difficult to make, but that are absolutely required for a system to do what it needs to do. So is it fair to say that these missions could not have even been accomplished prior to this technology rolling out? Uh, probably fair. I think it's always challenging with engineers, right? Because people will find a way to make what they need at some point, but the question is cost and lead time and everything else. So uh, this is absolutely a critical enabling technology for those missions. I think that sounds like a humble answer. <laughs> Maybe true. Yeah. Okay, Zach, you can go a few different ways with this question, but yep. I'm curious, what is the history between Go Engineer and Velo3D, or even like your personal history between yeah. Go Engineer? So, personally, my first exposure to Go Engineer was when I worked uh, at Halliburton, uh, and that was in 2014, so eight years ago. Uh, and Halliburton was the, the distributor for SolidWorks and for like the simulation software that we were working with uh, at that time. So I've had, I've had uh, a lot of experience working with Go Engineers, with Go Engineers reps. Um, and then even at the job after that, you know, we worked uh, specifically with metal additive manufacturing and Go Engineer um, with some of the, um, the customers that Go Engineer was running into who were interested in metal additive manufacturing. And so at Velo, our relationship with Go Engineer really started probably about three years ago. Um, and as a company, our goal is really to talk to design engineers, right? To talk to the people mm -hmm. who are most able to leverage the technology uh, and to help eliminate some of the challenges of manufacturing. So uh, working with Go Engineer as one of the leading resellers of, of SolidWorks is uh, made a ton of sense, right? It, that is the same core customer base that we're trying to talk to whenever we talk about uh, the manufacturing technologies, the solutions to their problems. Totally. And over the years, we've looked at metal additive manufacturing technologies and like going back, you know, to the mid 2010s. Yep. And we had some patience around that area, yeah. I would say. And so for the same reason, we looked at Velo 3D as a company that was at the forefront of that technology mm -hmm. and really had their pulse on what was going to really push the technology into a broader adoption and into some really exciting applications. So it made so much sense from the Go Engineer side as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So we're both in agreement that Velo 3D is different. Let's talk a little bit about how they are different, technology-wise, organizationally-wise. Like, what makes Velo 3D different than your competition? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a great topic. And that's kind of the core of, of uh, a lot of our value proposition. I think uh, one of the best stories that I can relate that, that maybe addresses that somewhat is when I first joined Velo 3D, I was the first uh, employee with any experience in additive manufacturing. And I joined this company of, of 20, 23 people uh, in 2016. Okay. And uh, it was this group of people who were working with metal additive manufacturing and didn't know what they couldn't do. They didn't know what the established rules were. So they were doing things that other companies said uh, were impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that kind of uh, core belief that you know any problem can be solved with uh, with enough effort and perseverance is really what drives uh, our mission 
Uh, and that's maybe more from kind of a, an organizational or kind of um, beliefs perspective mm -hmm. than anything else. I could see how that would really influence the path of the technology and also like the hiring path and just the growth of the company. Just this vision that is unbounded. And it's easy, it's easier to do that in a company of 20 people. It's much <laughs> harder to do it in a company of how many people? Uh, we're over, well over 200. Over 200 people, so growing very quickly. Growing very quickly, yeah, absolutely. So that's another, that's a challenge. Yeah, that's definitely a challenge. And it's been, I think one of the challenges there has been going from uh, kind of a research driven uh, development organization into, you know, a publicly traded technology company. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of the pains that go with transitioning into actually selling a product, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you mentioned the research driven side of this company because I don't know if I've met a company in this space that has like so many well educated people working in the top ranks, like PhDs everywhere. I definitely have a little bit of imposter syndrome when I come and walk <laughs> the floors here. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it starts with Benny, right? It starts with our CEO and founder, and he's a physicist uh, and is unapologetic about being a physicist. Yeah, yeah, so, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Velo 3D organizationally. Mm -hmm. What about the technology, like the machines that we're standing in front of? Yeah, so there are really, when it comes down to it, I think two fundamental value propositions for what Velo does. And these are our real differenti differentiators. The first is the geometries that you can print. Right, so we started by looking at some of the uh, design rules that Metal Additive had imposed on engineers and basically saying, how can we eliminate those? And it really came down to overhanging structures. Um, so if you have, you know, like a inner diameter uh, tubing running through a part, being okay. able to print those without requiring support structure in those critical areas, because that can be very difficult to remove. It can make a part essentially unprintable. Okay. And so I think of, when I think of internal channels, anything that has fluid flowing through it, right? Just yeah, that's... air, water, yep. fluid of any sort. Yep, yeah, exactly. And so we always say parts that fluids flow through or that transfer heat. Those are, those are uh, the things that are, are often best suited for our manufacturing technology. Yeah, which maybe are not the most flashy parts, but they're the parts that are hidden inside critical infrastructure components yep. and like all around us. Yeah, yeah, and they are they are hidden everywhere. I think that's one of the things that's really interesting. If you look at pumps or heat exchangers, you know, in this room, there are thousands of those. Yeah. Honestly, some of the most boring conferences and trade shows I've been to are like the ones that you guys are like, oh yes. Yeah. Customer, customer, <laughs> customer, customer. That's fair. So you have some incredible hardware that's enabling that, but also software too, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that probably gets to the second value proposition that I was referring to, which is really around um, the the ability to print these parts consistently and reliably in a scalable way. And so with that, the vertically integrated solution where we have our print preparation software, the printer itself, and then the quality assurance software on the back end really allows a customer to go from a CAD file, right, to go from your SOLIDWORKS output and uh, get one printed part, but also then scale that in the supply chain, whether that's inside of the customer's manufacturing facility or across a network of contract manufacturers. I love that you guys take on the hardware side, mm -hmm. the preprint software side, and also the quality assurance side, because so many uh, machine manufacturers in our space say, we're gonna do just one thing. Yep. And they tell their customers, if you're going to be successful, you're going to have to be successful with this and this and this. And I think it stands out and it's worth noting that you guys take on that burden of success entirely by saying, we're gonna control and provide the solution for the entire ecosystem. Yeah, what we, what we tend to talk about when we're talking to customers uh, in terms of our product is the ability to print the part that you want. And that's not just the machine, right? That's not just a print preparation software. It really needs to be this holistic suite of solutions that when you put them together, actually gives you the ability to, to print the part you need and to do yeah. it scalably. So that kind of leads into another question I have is, what does it look like to be in the customer's shoes? A Velo 3D customer experience, yep. what does that feel like? Yeah, it's, it's uh, I would say that it's very different. 
Uh, and I have some experience both as a customer of metal additive manufacturing machines and working at, uh, at other metal additive manufacturing companies. It really is essentially white glove service, right? Because the goal again is that customers can just print the parts and not yeah. have to worry about, you know, all of the all of the different things that might come with system maintenance or process development or part specific uh, tweaking to get something to work. Yeah, we just want people to be able to print the parts and yeah. put them into you know whatever uh, crazy aerospace defense application they're they're working with. Yeah, I mean I think it really is hard to exaggerate how critical some of the parts uh, coming off these machines are to important human missions, space explora exploration as an example. Yeah. Does it keep you up at night? Like, what's your stress level like when you know these parts are printing out there and your machines are pushing humanity forward? Like, in, in reality, yeah. they are. I, I don't think it's really stressful. I think, honestly, it's, uh, it's humbling to be able to play a part in it, right? I think we get to work with customers who are doing some of the most amazing things you can possibly think of. And it's just a privilege, really, to be able to interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis and to help them accomplish these kind of ridiculous things that they're trying to do. So uh, I don't lose sleep. Honestly, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it really is a privilege. Fulfilling. Yeah, it, it is, it is, yeah. It's like more that. than just the machine, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So when you're starting a company and you're developing a product, you really have to find product market fit, right? And yep. it's challenging. Yep. And once you find that, you kind of run with it for a certain amount of time yep. until you build enough success that you can kind of branch out. And I think that you've hit that with aerospace and energy. No doubt, everybody who's doing space exploration right now is associated with Velo 3D. But I suspect that you don't want to stay there and be pigeonholed there. So can yeah. you tell me a little bit about some of the industries that you're branching out into? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's exactly like you, you described, right? There's a technology adoption curve and we definitely focused on a beachhead originally, but um, kind of going back to the application space, the parts that fluids flow through that transfer heat, you start to uh, take some of these things, right? Uh, take like a a turbo pump for a rocket engine okay. and look at the components of it and then they become it becomes clear that uh, there are very similar components in in uh, like natural gas compression technology mm -hmm. uh, or if we look at uh, uh, high pressure die cast tooling as an example right these are these are uh, massive mm -hmm. parts that have conformal cooling and so it's a part that fluids flow through for the express uh, reason of transferring heat so especially with the large machine, uh, we're starting to see a lot of interest in, as an example, uh, die cast tooling. Being able to make really large tooling inserts uh, with large internal flow paths so you can get more effective cooling. Um, and like in the electrification of vehicles, that's becoming a yeah. really important conversation topic. Yeah, absolutely. So can you put on your uh, future predicting hat? I don't know what that's called, but... <laughs> What do you think the next, let's say, three to five years looks like? So I think there's a huge untapped uh, potential demand in maintenance and repair applications. Okay. Uh, so when you look at, uh, at power generation, at um, gas turbines for, uh, for aviation, or even uh, in like pump components, valving, those types of things, there are warehouses that have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of components that are just sitting there uh, taking up shelf space and kind of waiting for them to be used. And the idea of manufacturing on demand and kind of a digital distribution of manufacturing starts to enable this maintenance and repair industry to really leverage additive manufacturing and, and metal additive specifically. Uh, and it's, it's hard to uh, even comprehend how big that potential market is. And that's very different than kind of the new product uh, yeah. area where we've tended to focus uh, and, and is a little bit more conservative, a little bit slower to adopt, but once it gets rolling, it's gonna be a really big deal. And I think the timing for that application is approaching because it's that, that idea of just-in-time manufacturing and reducing inventory, digital inventory, was something that we had been aware of and right. talked about, but it wasn't really until like the last couple years where yeah. we see lockdowns and supply chain just 
getting crushed, that people and like companies buying extra inventory, not knowing what's going to happen and then just sitting on it and having to liquidate it. It's, yep. it's a little bit of a mess. Yeah, it is. It really is kind of a, uh, a solution that's presenting itself at the right time because the last two years have been, I mean, even for us here, right? It's been really challenging from a supply chain perspective. Uh, and so that whole idea of, of uh, digital warehousing and distributed manufacturing, I think it's, it is uh, set to take off for sure. Absolutely. So team, we are here to learn more information for your sake. Um, I think there are some things that I would love for you guys to get out of this conversation, but what would you like uh, you know, our team to know about Velo 3D? I, mean, I think the biggest thing for us, for Velo, is really uh, just an alignment on what we're trying to bring to customers, right? And I think uh, in, in my past, Go Engineer has always been about enabling engineers to uh, kind of push the boundaries, to have the tools they need to do their job effectively. And that's, that's exactly what, what Velo is really focused on too. So uh, if you're ever you know, working with a customer and there are challenges that they're having outside of maybe the design space, when it comes into manufacturing things that are challenging or crazy. And when, yeah, when you say challenging, you really mean like, that doesn't sound physically possible. I think that violates all of the laws of physics. Yep, yeah, those are, those are the kind of problems <laughs> we like to help people with, right? I think those are uh, oftentimes where some of the most interesting uh, uh, challenges really are. Uh, the hardest parts, uh, the hardest design space, that, that's, that's where we like to play. The hardest. Yeah. I like it, I like it. We can do easy stuff too, right? But a lot of times the most compelling, uh, the most compelling projects are the hard ones. Yeah, you guys are mm -hmm. out there trailblazing, I would say. Um, alongside some of your own customers. Yeah. Now I understand you probably can't name most of your customers, but are there some household names that you've been working with that people would recognize? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, you know some of these were released in a lot of like our investor presentations. Now that we're a public company, um, but we've worked with companies like uh, in the space industry, like SpaceX, uh, like Launcher Space, uh, several of the others that are developing. Uh, rocket engines, launch vehicles, kind of solutions for access to space. Um, when we're talking about maybe more of the aerospace and defense side, uh, we've recently had announcements with Pratt & Whitney, with Lockheed Martin, uh, with some of the major defense primes. Um, we have LAM Semiconductor, which is uh, a company that we've worked with. They're about a half mile up the street here from where we are currently. Mm -hmm. um, so a pretty broad set of customers across different industries. Uh, that are really pushing the envelope in their own respective field as far as, as what's possible and, and yeah. what they can do. And I think your customers fit two profiles. You have large OEM customers, like you just mentioned, and then you have another sector of customers that are the people who make parts for those OEMs. And that is a significant chunk of your customer base, right? Yeah, yeah, contract manufacturing. I mean, I, it, it kind of has to be part of the solution, right? There are people who are professional at making things uh, and those people need the tools to make the parts for their end customers. And so both in terms of you know, OEMs, the people who are, have the design authority and internal manufacturing, and then the contract manufacturing network, uh, I think those are, those are both part of it. And I would say there's a third group, which is uh, kind of the uh, less well-established startup type of, of uh, groups, right? So we, we tend not to turn away uh, maybe some of the more outlandish and crazy startup ideas yeah. because I mean, that's kind of where we came from, right? That's that's our blood too. Yeah, that would be a little bit hip hypocritical. Yeah, I think. Yeah, for sure. I think it's fascinating how when we go out and talk about Velo machines, mm -hmm. we're really out there searching for parts. Yep. We're searching for ideas, the parts that come out of those ideas, and then those parts are so unique that the machine sale follows up with that. You find the part, you get a contract for the part, and then someone's going to have to get the machine to make it. Yeah, and, and that's like the compelling value is really in the parts themselves, right? And if you can, if you can find a part where uh, it's being uh, compromised due to manufacturability, but it plays a really critical role in, in whatever system it's part of, those are kind of the core of where we find, uh, find people who want the system or want the solution to contract manufacture. I loved all those answers. I really enjoyed talking with you today. We, we'd go back a few years. Yep, absolutely. And I have a great time.
chatting with you. So thank you for your time. Thank you for hosting us. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a beautiful facility. Thank you. And I can't wait to come back. All right. Always welcome. <laughs>